but remember, one of the great things, talking about our partnership with the Chamber of Commerce, one of the things we have uh, is that we've had a partnership now in our second year with them where the white man president gets to serve on the Chamber of Commerce board. And uh, it's obviously an opportunity for Tequila, it's an opportunity for myself last year. And I want to give her an opportunity now to come forward to introduce the, the uh, people who will be serving on the second panel. It's a little different structure. These people are going to be making some prepared remarks. And then we'll go straight to questions from the audience. But uh, Tequila? Sears Roebuck, JCPenney, Kmart, and other chain stores. 
The factory kept growing and growing and expanding, and eventually we wound up with factories in Rocky Mount, Dole Rock, Robertsonville, Mahoskey, and Franklin, North Carolina, which is on the other side of Asheville. How we got there, I don't know. We had approximately 1,400 employees, and then it happened, NAFTA. The NAFTA agreement was signed, and that enabled companies to move to Mexico, South America, and Asia. That agreement killed about 90% of all American products that were uh, made in this country. Rocky Mount Ungon was one of the first industries to break the color barrier in the early 60s. Did, Dad did not wait for the government to tell him to do so. He did what he felt was right. Dad told me, when I asked him about it, Dad told me, I will hire anyone that is willing to work. I guess I learned from my dad to do what it takes to get the action done, to do what is right, and to give more than what is expected. I grew up in the textile industry. I went to Atlanta Christian College, now known as Barton, and then I went to work in our New York office uh, to work in sales, production, development. Our office was in the Empire State Building, and that was exciting, believe me. It was hard work, it was a lot of fun. I worked with my brother Dave, and he was also a major influence in my life. He taught me the uh, art of the deal, the art of the sale, and how to deal effectively with people. And if you can imagine, if you're dealing with Sears, Pennies, and Kmart, you're dealing with some very difficult people. When I moved back to Rocky Mountain, my friends were in college or had moved away. It was the same old story back in the early 70s. There's nothing to do in Rocky Mount. And if you lived in Wilson, Raleigh, Fayetteville, or anywhere, it felt like there was nothing to do anywhere. A friend suggested that I get involved with a local civic group. He suggested the Rocky Mount JCs. I was invited to a meeting. They had a good speaker. They had a good meal. And an announcement that there was a project to be held that Saturday, and they needed volunteers. I volunteered. There I got a chance to meet and talk with other young members of the community. Yes, I was young then. Maybe that's good. <laughs> I had a great time. I did something positive for the community, and I attended the next meeting. I joined the club. I kept meeting people. I volunteered for every project and event that came along. And then I realized how selfish I was. By helping others, I was having a good time meeting people, doing positive things for the community, and building my personal skills in project management, raw rules of order, learning how to work with a rock wide range of people. I managed, pro uh, I managed projects like the Miss Rocky Mount Contest, the Haunted House, I worked at the JC booth at the fair, and I just had a ball. I've done things that I would never have done and met people from all over the state and nation simply by being involved. Over the years, I saw people come into the organization and stay a few months and then leave, saying they were not getting anything out of it. <coughs> the truth is, they never put anything into it. If you want to succeed, you must put effort into it. Unfortunately, the JC organization does not exist in Rocky Mountain anymore. But there are so many good civic clubs out there that you can join and get involved and put in effort to make things happen. Strangely enough, you will see great changes in the community as well in yourself. The civic experience, the civic club experience taught me a good lesson. To succeed in life, you must put effort in. You must work hard, you must work with people, you must follow, you must lead, you must listen, you must learn, you must be involved in the community, and you must do. After Rocky Mountain Undergarment closed, I went downtown to a small little TV station, WRMY. It was right here on Washington Street. I don't think anybody in the world except Gene and I knew it was there. Uh, and I volunteered my time, and I wanted to learn how television works. I always had an interest in radio, television, video, movies, film, whatever. But at WRMY, 
I learned a lot there. What to do to make the community TV station work, but maybe more important, what not to do to make a local community TV station work. And I think he knows exactly what I'm talking about. The station is sold to PAX Communication. It is now ION TV, WRPX, with a, with channel six on, on the cable. About a year later, the license for WHIG TV fell into my hands and I started full throttle to make it happen. In December of 1997, WHIG TV officially went on the air and I wanted this to be a truly community TV station. I wanted civic clubs, church groups, small local businesses to feel at home with WHIG TV. I didn't want to price myself out of the market and I wanted to be affordable, friendly, and available to the citizens of our area, which I feel I have done. Any one of you is invited to visit our facility. If your church group or civic club or business uh, can use the services of WHIG TV, please feel free to call me. In this life, you have to be a self-starter. You can't wait for the committee to give you permission or direction. You have to go and do it yourself. You have to get involved, and most of all, you have to give back. We all know the golden rule. No, it's not the golden rule that he who has the gold rules. It's the other one. Treat others as you would like to be treated yourself. This is a simple philosophy, and you will be surprised how well the golden rule works. People are treated well, treat others well, and sooner or later, it comes back to you. Did you know that a smile is contagious? <laughs> yeah, except for Jesse. There you go. <laughs> smile at somebody, and they'll smile back. You do not need an interpreter to communicate a smile. I've been in France, they understood it. I was in Italy, they understood it. Uh, I smiled in Boston, Florida, and right here in Rocky Mountain. Smile will always come back to you. And on attitude, it's what you make of it. It's how you react to any situation that will set the tone to follow. So before you react, think to yourself, what can I do to make this a better outcome? We are all part of a giant network connected and committed to others. If you boost each other, then we all grow. If we treat each other with respect and dignity, we all grow. All I'm doing is encouraging you to step up to the plate. What's the worst or the best thing that can happen? You're either going to strike out or hit a home run. But you'll never know until you try. You are the future leaders. You are presently our leaders. You are the ones in the future that will take charge of government, businesses, civic and church organizations. You can watch things happen, or you can make things happen. It's your choice. Personally, it's more fun to be in the driver's seat. If you're going to be an entrepreneur, you must be ambitious, you must work a little bit harder, and you must be willing to take risks. And if you treat other people well, if you have a good attitude, there is no limit to what you can achieve. Thank you. interviewing other people and getting them to talk and helping them be all they can be. I'm not used to giving speeches, so you're going to have to bear with me. First, I want to say, Young Professional Network, you all are already winners because you care about your community and you've made a commitment by joining this organization to really say that, that you are interested in Rocky Mountain's future, that you're invested in Rocky Mountain's future. And as somebody like her who's been around for a while, it's so important for us to see you all come and take the reins in a lot of things and really show that you care about Rocky Mountain and invest in it in, in every way. And we're going to talk about invest in every way and kind of look at the condition of Rocky Mountain and what each and every one of you and we can do to make the future of Rocky Mountain the best it can be. I want to do a little exercise with you first, though. Many of you have seen the movie Time to Kill. Matthew McConaughey, Sandra Bullock, and Samuel Johnson. 
at the end, when Matthew is giving the charge to the jury, he said, I want everybody to close their eyes. I want y'all to close your eyes. I want you to think about the person you love most. And you have to say who it is. Please don't. And if you're, there's not a person, a dog. Maybe you've got a dog or a cat. And just <laughs> now think in terms of little by little, that person has a wound here, a wound there. Just little by little gets hit here, hit there, and slowly goes down hill. And it just breaks your heart because you want to help and you want to do something. Okay, open your eyes. And that's what's happened to Rocky Mount. And it's in our hands to do something about it. And indeed, we can. I did some research on, you know, what other people are saying about how to turn around communities, how to build back up communities. In a recent Time Magazine article, the New Economic Foundation, which is an independent think tank based in London, said many local economies are languishing not because of too little cash that comes in, but as a result of what happens to that money. Money is like blood in the community. It needs to keep moving around to keep the economy going. When money is spent, spent elsewhere, this is a good time going into Christmas to talk about this, such as at big supermarkets, at out-of-town stores, at non-locally owned box stores, it flows out of the community like a wound. By shopping at the corner store instead of the big box, consumers keep their communities from becoming ghost towns. I was at a Chamber small business meeting earlier today, and um, we were told that the Moore County Chamber of Commerce has lost 100 members in the last year. And went on to say that the reason why is that 75 of those, those members that were lost, 75 of the 100, have, were all small businesses that have gone out of businesses, out of business, but that could have been saved if the community had, if they saw help, if the community had supported them. A number of researchers and organizations are taking a closer look at how the money flows and that what they're finding shows the profound economic impact of keeping money in the town how the fate of many communities around the nation and the world increasingly depend on that. We just need to put a fence and say, if you have to leave town, you know, leave your money here. Because we have to keep it churning in our community. If you think of businesses, and all of you can name lots of them that have closed in Rocky Mountain the last few years, we used to be. I moved here 25 years ago. We were a big hub. We had parties. We had peoples. We had planters. We had... Oh, just belt downtown. We had almonds downtown. Um, downtown was thriving and lively, and I just it was just very, very different. We recently lost Sunnyside Up, Dean Grace, Patty Jace, um, Sarah Phoenix, to name a few. But we need to ask ourselves, what are we doing to keep them here? Are we making it part of our shopping plan and our supporting local, locally owned, not just local, but locally owned, um, are we willing to give that up to, to lose the unique flavor and, and just have money drained out of Rocky Mount? I'm not willing to do it. To buy from a store, a local store, and I'll just throw out all and since I know that best, um, what I do is I take, when you shop with, with us, I take money that we, we bring in and I buy advertising with her. I buy print advertising with local people. Um, I buy store supplies locally. I buy insurance from a local insurance agent. We join the Chamber of Commerce. We support the Junior Guild. We support Rocky Mount Academy. We support Nash Rocky Mount Schools. We support almost every nonprofit in town. But do you think when the big box stores and big chain stores here, do they buy their print advertising locally? Do they advertise with her? Do they churn the money locally? No. They Big headquarters out of state. That's where they, they buy there, they print there, and they give all their business, not in Rocky Mount. So money that goes into those stores goes promptly out of town to their headquarters, and all of their, just the ripple effect of the dollars goes straight out of our pockets, straight out of our town, and it's our lifeblood. It's what we need. It's what we, what we depend on. Um, Ken gave me a good idea. He said, "He said, well, you need to tell, you need to talk people into shopping locally at a pharmacy." And he threw out through to me a couple of things that he's encountered with his wife, and, and we appreciate your business, Ken. But I'm like, every one of you is an ideal customer for almonds, and I'm just going to use us as an example. 
if you travel, the comment was made, well, if you travel, you need to be at a box store because if you're out of town and you need something, you can go there. For 70 years, people have been able to have a, go in a pharmacy and out of town, have them call us, we transfer the prescription. It takes, it's very common, it takes two minutes for them to do that. <coughs> That's not an excuse. If your child or spouse gets sick in the middle of the night, there's only one pharmacy in town that I'm aware of that's open 24 hours. They are dead as a doornail in the middle of the night, I can tell you, because I went in there with my husband with a kidney stone. Um, but our pharmacists will meet people. They do emergency bills all the time for people. are happy to do that. But on a personal note, when we went there, I walked in. Uh, I handed the prescription. Um, he was screaming and hollering like, Sick men do, no <laughs> but Anyway, I said, we're in a really big hurry because it was like 1 o'clock in the morning and, and I want to get him home. And they said, 15 minutes. And I said, why? There's nobody here. I mean, there's not a person in the store. He said, it's 15 minutes. That's what we take. 15 minutes, no matter when. That's our minimum time, waiting time. So, <laughs> Wow. Okay. Okay. That, yeah, absolutely. And, and yeah, good point. Herb. Thank you. Herb, did y'all hear that? Herb said they want you to shop and buy other stuff. Um, the only drugs that you probably need to have access to if you go out of town are maintenance drugs. You all look young. You probably don't take a lot of maintenance drugs. We are known in almonds. We have always gone the extra mile with early fields and people are going out of town. Um, most box stores will not advance you. We, we write down the information and we bill it when, when it gets time to have it refilled. But we always treat people like, well, we're known for calling by name and treating you like family. We don't try to have everything the convenience store has. No, we don't have beach toys, milk, ice cream, a um, hundred versions of every single thing there's ever been. But what we do have is every single basic, usually customary, over-the-counter item in both brand and generic, and we are told all the time that our prices are lower than the box stores. That's where they make a lot of their money. They keep you waiting, and you buy overpriced stock all around the store. Plus, as Kim pointed out, we have a lot of cute niche stuff, like a pop carry type of stuff, and we'll order stuff. People come in, they'll say, my grandmother used to use such and such a liniment. And Missy Philitas, who's at Western, just say, oh yeah, that's so-and-so. We can get that for you, or it's over on the aisle so-and-so. So we really do try to have a lot of kind of niche items. Um, mail order, I'm sure all of you have been called many, many, many times being told the, the glorious aspect of why you should go to mail order. We have drive through windows. We deliver to homes and offices daily, Monday through Friday. But one thing that really matters to me is the peace of mind to know that the person who hands me something that I'm going to put in my body or my child's body, I'm looking at that person. And that person in that business stands behind that item or that what, what you're going to take. And they're there. They've been there for a long time. They're going to be there long. But they stand behind it. And I've just always had kind of an aversion to having the mailman deliver my drugs. And I just really think, and again, you get to the churn thing because so many, if you get a mail work, all the money's going right out of the state, out of the city and out of the state. Physicians tell us all the time they love working with us. They can get us on the phone. We respond quickly. We call them if we see something that we think might be in conflict with something they're taking. We have just a super rapport with physicians. We have people work. Our pharmacists are all from the local area. Or Mickey Lee, who's only been here 40 years, is the only one who's not a Nash County native. But their moms, grandmothers, fathers, they care deeply. They know how you feel. And we are just known for just have a very loyal, honest um, pharmacists who, who really are known for their accuracy um, and take the time to come out from behind the pharmacy, stand there, talk to you as long as you want to be talk to you. Plus, we get people calling all the time saying, I'm not feeling well and I'm not sure if I should go to the doctor or not. And pharmacists have at least six years of education after the 12th grade. And so they are very good, very well-trained healthcare professionals. So take advantage of them. But in a place that's locally owned, they get to know you, they, they care and want to help you one-on-one -on -one talking about whatever your issues are with your health and give you all the advice or they'll go look it up on our computers and help you. Um, as the nation limps through the recession and has trouble pulling it out of the recession, many towns are hurting by local campaigns. 
can help a local economy withstand the downturn. For communities such as Rocky Mountain, the hopeful message is that it's not about how much money you've got, but how much you keep circulating without letting it leak out. And let's not let our money leak out of Rocky Mountain. Let's support people who keep it here, who churn it here, and make our community strong. A great friend of mine, Jim Dickens, whom a lot of y'all know, has a, has a statement that he makes very frequently. If you can't buy it in Rocky Mountain, you probably don't need it. <laughs> um, and I agree with that. Your business, your personal business, is the blood of our local businesses. Let's all do our part keeping it right here in Rocky Mountain. Thank you. Tell you a different story. 
about a woman I call her Jill. She's about 50 years old and has been on the other side of the problem that Jack has had. He was selling drugs and she was used to taking them. She's about 50 years old and has had a cocaine habit now for probably 25, 30 years. So she managed to get busted every now and then with, with small amounts and just has numerous just little petty misdemeanor charges that she's accumulated over the last 25, 30 years. But she's gotten to the point that her record is just so bad that every single time she's seen in a courtroom, she gets sent off to prison. Around January of this year, Jill ends up back in court again. She was caught walking down the street and also stopped had a conversation with her and she had a little glass pipe in her purse, a little crack pipe, a little piece of glass down at about like that, about that long. Well, that little pipe is worth 120 days in prison. And that's what she does. She ends up going away for 120 days. She comes out. This is just what she does. She gets caught again about two months later. She's gone again for 120 days. So that's about eight months out of a year that she's been in prison over that little glass tube. I started out giving you a number, $1,020, $1,019.13. It's the average amount of money that the average taxpayer is putting into the system. I just told you that Jill spent eight months in prison just this year, just in the year 2020. Not 2011. It's 11, right? Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> For us to keep her there, it costs $8,920.80 for each four month stay. So instead of being productive, and that's $74.34 a day, that's roughly what it costs to house a person in a prison here in the state of North Carolina. So for having a couple of glass stems, Jill has cost us almost $20,000. That's 20 people working for a year at basic minimum wage jobs. All of their tax dollars went to do absolutely nothing. <coughs> Her locked up. That's a way of saying no, that's wrong, don't do it. Let's talk about Jack's situation. You know, Jack spent, he was on probation for a little while on based on the situation I told you about a little bit earlier. He has spent a total of 11 months in custody in the last few years. That's again about $20,000 that we spent to have this person locked up as a way of saying no, 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 don't do it again. And one of the reasons Jack went back to doing some of the things that he should not have been doing is because he could not find a job because of that question. I say all that to say that there has to be a way, one, for entrepreneurs or business owners to start, one, overlooking those questions. Because this is something that negatively impacts the entire state, the entire country. But more so small towns like Rocky Mountain pretty much anywhere east of I-95 in this state. Because we're not sharp. We don't have three or four colleges and a whole host of new people with fresh blood flowing into our city every single year. Think about how many students attend North Carolina State in Raleigh every year. How many fresh new 18-year-olds are showing up every single year that are going to be in school looking for work and join, uh, looking for part-time work and kind of join into the workforce. Here, we don't have the benefit of fresh blood. But we have a large part of our population here in this city who are in this same situation. When Sam's Club first came here, I forget the exact numbers, but I believe it was over 600 of their applications were turned down because people had to answer that question. Yes, we, I think they were crime with it. So one, I would say, it's definitely in the best interest of everyone here who owns a business, everyone here who has contact with somebody who does to try to work with folks through their problems. Because otherwise, we're just going to continue to spend more and more of our tax dollars, and they're going to be less and less put up to be. We had, uh, yeah, I just lost my train of thought. I haven't done it. I'm just trying to squeeze as much as I can here in about 10 minutes, and I keep looking over that can to see what you can tell me to say. You got four. I got four. Okay, I'll make a few more. I'm being, I'm being lean. <laughs> we have, uh, on the other side of that, it's also a really big problem when it comes time to start applying to college and going to school. One of the things I did in preparation for a similar talk like this I gave recently, I contacted North Carolina A&T where I went to school and had them send me uh, application for admissions. And sure enough, they have the same questions listed there. 
North Carolina State, every university within the uh, public school system have those same questions listed. So what we have is almost created a complete subclass of people that is costing us money to support. Because these are folks who if they're not working, one, they're doing something, they're doing something they're getting paid. They're cutting grass, they're raking leaves, and they're not paying any taxes. That's no payroll taxes coming out of the money they're getting under the table. That's no income taxes that they're paying. And unfortunately, if their income is that low and they're receiving some kind of government aid, food stamps or something of that nature, they're shopping without handing sales tax. So essentially, taking these people out of the regular economy hurts all of us. Now, I don't know exactly what all the solutions are. We have got a few great programs that the state has provided to allow some folks to clean their records, so it's not a problem anymore. So there's a way you can petition to have certain things removed off of your criminal record. But it's so few things, it's misdemeanor, your little big stuff. Your 17-year-old kid who stole a hat and gun, you can get that fixed. But for the 25-year-old who has a serious record, we're going to have this man as a member of our society, as a member of our community now for God willing that he lives a long life in the next 30, 40 years. We need him to be able to be a taxpaying citizen and to actually participate in the real economy as opposed to in the second class economy that we have. I would invite all of you, one of the most interesting places and Lodge Dr. you mentioned to him that he was there recently. One of the most interesting places you can go and spend your time is to pick a day on Monday, Wednesday, or Thursday and come by the courthouse over there in Boca Road and just sit back and just watch some of the folks that you would probably never see in a normal during the day setting that most of us spend our days in and see how many of them are some, some bad people. I mean, some folks don't need the benefit of the doubt. There's some bad people who would do bad things to each other, so we need them locked away and we should spend our tax dollars to keep them But you have some folks who simply cannot get a break. And in a way, it's because of questions like the one that is contained in every job application that there is. So I ask that in a way, in a part of supporting the, in a part of supporting the community and businesses here in the city to try to encourage folks that you know that wherever you work, just let them know. It may be a good idea to at least give somebody a shot and not overlook that sort of thing. And I would hope that one day we can have be in a place where we have more employed, employed people in Rocky Mountain than unemployed people. Because there are a lot of folks that, and Ken's walking up, they're about to take the mic away from me. But I think you all get my point. <laughs> I'd like to ask a question that was very interesting, um, what you spoke about, and I, I certainly would love to to help um, be a part of, of making um, our tax dollars go in the right direction. Um, but, um, Mr. Solomon, um, I um, My name's Will. Will. <laughs> um, how do you, as an employer in a small business, um, my employees have to be bonded um, to work for me um, in a jewelry store. And if I was to employ someone that was part of that second class, unfortunately, um, they probably couldn't get bonded. And secondly, you know, the, the fear that I have, and not that I don't believe in giving people second chances, because I really do believe in giving people second chances, is the knowledge that desperate people do desperate things. And they, they, they revert to those choices when they're in desperate situations. And obviously, you know, you told two stories of, of people who unfortunately went back to the lifestyle that they were living uh, before they got clean and uh, had to go back to it. And, and it's a vicious cycle. Um, help me understand how I could be a part of the solution. Well, first I'll say that before I used to talk, I've been talking about this issue for a long time. One day my wife said, well, you talk a whole lot, but what are you actually doing to try to help? So I kind of put my money where my mouth is. One of the part-time folks who works in my office in the fall of And haven't, haven't had any problem yet uh, how it's hurt. 
But a lot of the issues that we deal with in this area are going to be legislative. And it's something that you may want to sit down and have a conversation with your representatives, your state senators, and let them know that this is something that I would like to try to reach out and help some folks, but right now this person can't get bonded because of their past. Is there a way that would you be interested in sponsoring or supporting legislation that would allow insurance companies and bonding agencies to work with different types of folks, kind of pull them out from being in that second class? Because it does cost them, it costs us an obscene amount of money to do what we do. I believe we have the 11th highest in the country, in North Carolina, we've got the 11th highest rate of non-violent incarcerated people in the United States at a cost of $9,000 every four months. So I mean, it's costing us a obscene amount. But uh, the second part of your question, it's, it's something that you, it, it's kind of, you have to make, you have to be comfortable helping folks. And I would never, and I mean, it's me personally, I don't think I would ever hire anyone to count my money that has 50 larceny committed in my system. <laughs> so I mean, common sense has to come in as well. But I, did I just answer both your questions? Or? You did. You did. Okay. It, 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 it's a hard place to be. Yeah. <coughs> I think. Uh, I think. I think it's a possible follow up, and then we'll allow to try to focus on the other two presenters because we can sit here and talk about this all day. Um, what are some state? Are there states out there that are making improvements or are making reforms that are addressing this issue, or is this really a situation that North Carolina? like other states, really doesn't have a solution and because the higher incarcerated share of population has a bigger problem, it doesn't, but there's other states that have better solutions. Actually, North Carolina is doing a great job. We recently, just this past session, the Justice Reinvestment Act that was passed through the State House and State Senate went a long way and added a few different areas where people can have their records clean and have to search things exposed. But it's really a problem nationwide. There is no state that has a true what I would call an actual second chance program that lets somebody, no matter what your problems have been, if you've been good and been able to keep yourself clean for a year or two, we'll erase it, forget it, let you go out and try to rejoin society. There's no state that has a true program for that. All of the laws that we have in the books now, and it's pretty much similar all across the country, allows for someone who has, you had a problem when you were 28 to 16 and 18, and one time you could go clean out. Oddly enough, in, even in North Carolina and in most states right now, if you're driving home today and something happens, you happen to fit the description of somebody, you get charged with something, and three or four months from now, the charge is dismissed. Sorry, we had the wrong guy. You can have that expunged out of your record if something is dismissed only one time. If you had 10 different things that you were charged with and they've all been dismissed, but you went to trial and were found not guilty, but you've already used your one expunction to remove a dismissal, those other nine are still on your record. So you go apply for a job and you check the little block that says, no, I've never been convicted of anything, because it's true, you have But then your employer goes and runs your record and they see that you were charged with all these other things, but you went to trial and you're found not guilty or the state chose to dismiss the charges. That's still up there. And also still also with magistrate charges. Exactly. That's anything that's up there still shows, even though it's been dismissed. So you've got folks who human resources may take a look at your record and say, well, you probably did, but it just didn't get dismissed, or there's no real way to clarify that sort of thing. So a lot of these issues have to be fixed from the legislative end of it. But until that's done, I think a good way to, and I know I, I do this whole thing where I talk about the last thing I want to say. But until that's done, the community can step up and say, you know what, I'm going to give this person a shot. I'm going to try to hire this person. So at least there can be some, you, somebody can sit down and agree, maybe able to tell somebody else, you know, I gave someone a shot to work out, it's not been a problem. And hopefully we can just one by one start to save the state some money and try to help reintegrate some of these folks in society. And there are some businesses here locally that do that. Yeah. Williams is one. There's a couple of construction companies that do that as well that I'm familiar with. So there are companies out there uh, that do that do focus on this. Some of them families are former law enforcement employees, so they're in some cases more comfortable working with these individuals. They are, they're more comfortable, they understand their backgrounds and those things. But there are some companies out there that do provide it. And the jobs are these the people who are committing the crimes um, uh, 
prior to them getting a job, there needs to be some kind of interaction uh, with like nonprofits that can prepare them to be in, going into to that positive direction because a lot of them, a lot of the people, they don't have like like social skills. You know what I'm saying? They're not. They don't understand what the what the real world asks of them. And there needs to be more. There need to be more nonprofits that can service help. You know these people get to that point. You know. So if there's not an, enough, you know, service um, nonprofit businesses to help in this area, then it's it's, it's not going to get to the next step. There's a great program in Tallboro. It's called It Starts with You Foundation. They do just that. And that's another issue where it's all about legislative action because those kind of agencies are mainly funded with grant money and with other money to do the things they do. But a lot of these folks, I mean, you'd be amazed at how many letters I get to mail from people that are sitting in jail that are 20, 25 years old who would be taking 10 minutes to sit down and read the letter because a lot of these people are fundamentally illiterate. Mm -hmm. And they have gone through the 10th, 11th grade in our public school system mm -hmm. and cannot write a letter that I can understand. You try to tell me what their problem is. And so you're right, a lot of that, there has to be some buffer between, you can't hire someone that's not hiring, mm -hmm. but at least you've got to be willing to give a person a shot if they're willing to take the steps to get hired. Okay, I might like to ask a question too. I know, uh, Ms. Alderman, you spoke on the fact of investing back in this city. As a native of Rocky Mountain, I was born here. I attended college in, in Greensboro, North Carolina, and then I left the city and lived in a couple of different places, from Atlanta to Philadelphia to New York, but I'm back here now. Um, just due to some things with my, own, my family here, um, I'm back here. And more than anything that I can think of right now, I want to be, I'm invested in this community. I am invested in this community. I want to see this place succeed. I have conversations that sometimes become heated discussions about, Joshan, why are you here? What the, what's the incentive here for you to be back in Rocky Mount? And I, I tell people that I see opportunity here in Rocky Mount. But I want to ask you all, what is the, what would you all say to someone like myself, who is educated, raised here, and I know people who have a strong foundation and doing great as far as their careers and their families, but they're somewhere else. I wanted to ask you all, what are the incentives that if you're talking to someone um, about this city and about coming back in here and investing in Rocky Mount. What are the things that we can kind of point out to those folks who may be interested in coming back and investing in businesses? I just wanted to see if there's anything out there, that if there's a program or anything that's basically in the works right now. But I think we need to be cheerleaders and we need to 
to talk about. I don't know of any specific job opportunities right around the corner, but I think if we can can change the culture in keeping our money here and circulating our money here and supporting each other for our goods and services, not letting out of town, you know, just siphon off everything out of town. I really think we can start rebuilding. Of course, the whole nation has taken a hit and is continuing to take a hit. But if we don't start, as these international economists say, keeping our money in town and supporting each other in very meaningful ways, that's how we'll be positioned to come back as the economy improves. And that didn't specifically answer your question, but just to kind of, I mean, I tell people, I, I mean, I'm working right now. Um, my husband died, so I commute from Scotland Neck every single day. And I, boy, I love being here. If y'all go to Scotland Neck, you can see why. <laughs> <laughs> say that um, everywhere I go people smile people people want to do the right thing and people want to help this community but life just doesn't hang out we're all here because we want to be and you can live anywhere in this country you live in several cities you live in several cities I've been in several cities I don't think there's anybody who's not lived in two or three different places uh, but we chose Rocky Mill and, and and just to, I guess, to follow up and to try to provide better in the study, the Twin County Competitiveness Study that was done at the end, that was presented first of this year by Dr. Johnson. In many ways, you kind of reiterated several different times, but accessibility is our is our biggest strength, and it's our greatest threat because being where we are positioned geographically is a phenomenal opportunity and has been for the city for a long time. At the intersection of I-95 and US-64, it's an ideal logistical location, it's an ideal distribution location. I mean, we don't talk about it much, but the snowbirds coming through here in September and October from New York, who drive down and stay at our hotels, you talk to hotel owners here, they know about it. Most of us don't unless you like go to a restaurant on the west side of town, but we do get a lot of business from snowbirds because it is the halfway point between here and their homes in Florida. At the same time, it is also a threat because what we are seeing now is that Raleigh-Durham, and, and Will was very specific, and I'm glad he made the point about NC State, or UNC and Duke. Population, I mean, growth is the key. Charles Penny, my boss, talks incessantly about the importance of growth, one way or another. And regardless of the mindset, you know, regardless of your political view as to how growth happens, it is the key. And What's really important is that we need people, and the reason why we chose entrepreneurs to be in these panels, even if they didn't talk specifically about business, the reason why we chose entrepreneurs is that all six of these individuals have one thing in common, they have a couple things in common. They all started businesses. They have all either started or changed their businesses or grown their business during the last three years when there's been a significant economic downturn and where we have a prolonged economic downturn here in the Rocky Mountain area. The, the statistics show that. They've all managed to continue to be successful. And there are a lot of national, global companies that are going to overlook certain areas because they're going to be focused, particularly when they're trying to get investors, they're going to be focused on what's hot and what's current. And they're going to, and they're going to, and they're going to stick with the trend with conventional wisdom. That is where Rocky Mountain has potential. It's important during the visioning process that we, that we first of all, that we use that opportunity to really define what we're going to be. You know, uh, Nash County, from what I understand yesterday, had a vote about what they wanted to put on the signs. Welcome. And I, I happened to be on uh, with DP yesterday morning talking about this event. And they, you know, one of the things people wanted to talk about was that they wanted to put it on there to say about sweet potatoes. And a lot of people don't realize that Rock, that the, Nash, the Twin County's strongest economic engine is agriculture. I personally believe, and I say this as a city employee, I say it personally, and I, I really say my employers, I believe agriculture has great potential not only for the whole region, but it also has great potential for the city of Rocky Mount. And I think that there's going to be a lot of other industries out there, but it's important for us to identify what our strengths are. And it's also important for all of you out there, whether you're working for somebody else, and it's more or less something that you can do for them, or something that you do on your own, 
if you think that you've got something that can add value to the city, sorry, Clint. Um, you're sitting here trying to tell me to shut up. Um, if you've got something that you believe that can add value to this area, you think about the two new restaurants that opened up on the west side of town in the last two weeks. A yogurt shop and a crepe shop. I mean, granted, I mean, people probably didn't think, man, that's probably not necessarily something that you would think of in Rocky Mountain. I mean, a yogurt shop goes for a crepe shop. fact is, it's got people in there. People are going there. And both of those are locally started businesses. So if you have an idea, as you've seen, whether it's basically paying out of, your, out, of, out of what you've got to live on or trying to put together a business plan that can secure capital, there is the opportunity to create that. There's a lot of needs that Rocky Mount has. And it's not just needs that need to be addressed by charities or by government. More and more, it's needs that need to be addressed by private business. And so the opportunity for growth is out there. And hopefully in the next two years, and starting on November 29th with the, uh, with the kickoff event, and I really encourage anybody who can to be there, I do think it will be a value, and you'll learn, particularly if you do want to contribute with this process, how you have that opportunity to contribute. I think you'll see that there is a lot that we can do. Is there any, are there any other questions, anyone? I would like to make sure we give everyone a chance. I'm also a transplant from New York. Uh, I uh, started a business on the Edgecombe County side of town about 15 years ago. It was a video store. I got no support from the city. I tried to open a, a sandwich shop right next door to my video store in a lot that I own. And the county, uh, the city, they had a, I was on the front page of the newspaper, the first time in my life, stopping me from starting a business on this side of town. This building here was closed. There was no new business on this side of town. And uh, keeping the, the money in the community is all we did, we tried to do. My wife was born in Rocky Mountain, and we decided to retire here. And uh, I kept the faith, though. I'm here at this meeting. Because I want to still, we still have our building, and we're going to do something on this side of town, finally. Yeah, Ed Ormsby, I mean, I mean, and for this is for general information, but small business centers with both Nash and Edgecombe Community College are, are wonderful resources. Ed Ormsby with Edgecombe, he's based out of Tarboro, but he does have an office here at the, at the Rocky Mount campus. Fred Brooks over at Nash Community College, over capital between here in Nashville. And Keith um, Davis is with SCORE. Right, Keith Davis with SCORE. For those of you, I mean, there are people though also who, I mean, there are a lot of resources out there. Johnny has worked with SCORE some. Um, and there are other groups. I do think that there, are, I do tend, I do see a change in attitude. And I believe that's important because there is, I, I think that that was an issue having, I've only been here, I've only lived here five years. And I do believe that there was, uh, there was a time when, when things were not as open or as inviting or as, um, and, and things needed to change. And I do see that that change is occurring. I also just want to point out one thing. You've seen the, I guess what we call the archeological excavation dig over on Main Street, um, we that was we when we started that. I mean, the Main Street re, the re, Main Street redevelopment has been a long undertaking, um, and there have been a lot of issues. Uh, don't, I mean, a lot of different issues have caused it to continue to be delayed. As you can see, that work has started. It is even to a greater magnitude than we thought it was going to be. I mean, we didn't realize we'd be digging down that deep. I don't think, but it's necessary. Uh, it's a major project, it is underway, and as much as y'all have seen with the redevelopment here at the Douglas Block, and of this facility and of the buildings nearby, you will see the same, you will see the same quality, the same effort along Main Street, and of course the other part of it now is working to get those buildings redeveloped so that once there's a Main Street in place, that there are businesses and there are commercial space available for people to release and that it's, uh, that it's usable and is in modern condition. Yes, if I could jump in real quick to the young lady in the green dress. I, that's something I wanted to say in response to your question. 
I'm also born and raised in Rock Valley. Been here my whole life except for going away to college and going away to law school. And the thing that keeps me here and the thing that I enjoy about it is this place is it anywhere you go, it's all about it. It is. I mean, at the end of the day, you close your eyes, go to bed at night, you don't know where you are, you're somewhere school. So you can be wherever you want to be. It's who you're spending your time with and what you're able to do when you're when you're up on the road. And the people here really want to make it a special place. Like they said, it does nothing to me like just going to the grocery store in between, getting out of my car and going to check out. I've run into 15 people I know and stop and spoke with them. And that's something that when I lived in Greensboro, it didn't happen as much. When I, I spent a lot of time out in Charlotte, out in Dallas, Texas, it doesn't happen as much. But that's something that happens here just all the time. So what makes this kind of place special, we're not going to be able to grow without having good people here to start that foundation. We can't have all of our high school graduates that go on to college, graduate, and never come back. But we're going to have a serious problem. So we need you here. We want you here. And it, you make you're one of the folks that's going to make the place for you. This will be the last comment. Uh, as somebody who's part of YPN and Rock Mountain Business Builders, I've been involved in the chamber and listening to the, the great panelists who volunteered their time today. I, I just want to say thank you all for doing that. Um, <laughs> One of the things that somebody who's in the, the financial industry that, and, and we heard Rita talk about it, Brian's talked about it, um, Herb's talked about it, Gene's talked about it, the personal time sacrificed to, to not just going to work every day, there's more to our community than having a paycheck and having a job, getting the business started, your dream, your time and investment in that. One of the things that I see as an analog to big business and corporations that maybe small business doesn't think about. Um, and this is just an example. Back in, in the early 90s, uh, Daryl's restaurants, if anybody remembers Daryl's, they were founded in Raleigh and put chains all around the country and so forth, and they, they died on the mine eventually. But we were doing some work with them at my other job, and I said, why don't y'all come to Rock Mountain? And they said, well, we did a feasibility study. We went into the community, we saw how many people lived in the area, we saw what the needs were, what was already being provided to see if we fit into the community. And y'all are a 599 all you can eat buffet town, and our business won't survive in Rocky Mountain that way. And they did it up. Now, of course, I was going to throw ruffle and all insults and say, how dare you say Rocky Mountain's not good enough for your business? But they did something before they made a decision. They made a feasibility study. They looked at the marketplace. They looked at where they were going to go. They mapped it out. They had a plan. They put numbers to paper and figured it out. Rose is a shiny example where she's found a niche that wasn't being served and is filling that niche is going to make a success out of it. I think if she did it, somebody else would come along and done it, and she's the first to the plate to get it done. That's how businesses, that's how you succeed. You don't necessarily carve and copy what somebody else is doing. You find your niche, you find what you're good at, you find your dream, and then you got to plan for it. you got to put that hard work, that, that, that sweat equity into it, as they say. And the last thing I want to say is in this economy as a financial person, this is the new norm. This is how life is going to be for a while. Everybody's waiting for it to get better. They're waiting for the banks to give more money. They're waiting for more customers to come in the door. If you keep waiting for it to change, you're waiting for it to come to you. You've got to go to it. This is the new norm. You've got to have that mentality that this is where you're going to operate in. This is how you need to operate. This is what your budgets, your, your employment situation, all that has to be around the idea that this is the new norm. And in the old days, and again, this goes into sweat equity, people went to their family, they went to their friends, even co-workers, and got what we call today angel investment. And then Johnny can tell you all about that kind of stuff, but your family members, in most cases, most small businesses today that have turned into corporations, started with family members putting investments in. Those are resources, whether they're in town, out of town, out of state, close family, cousins, whatever, that are quick access points that anybody who's looking to start a business should give consideration to because the banks are not going to be bringing it up. This is the new norm. Thank you, Clint, for those final comments. Um, and I want to thank our panel for being here. Sheila uh, had to uh, take care of uh, picking up her son. From, picking up her son. I want you all to wait just a second. Um, need somebody to help draw for this. We have three door prizes. Uh, we want to thank Decadent Delights and Freedom Credit Union uh, for coming uh, up with uh, door prizes for today. So, those right here. Everyone had one of these, so we'll start off with the first one. Will. Okay. Thank you.
Gene Kitchen. Thank you very much for being here and seeing you.